Hey folks, over the past couple of weeks on our Thursday Google Hangouts, Grant Cunningham and I have been taking some time to talk about some foundational principles that go along with what it means to, to understand, to be ready to use, to have a, a quality defensive firearm. We've talked about why you want a defensive firearm, why you might want that to be a handgun. We've talked a lot about efficiency, and today we're going to talk about one, one specific aspect of efficiency, excuse me, and that is reliability. We'll talk about it in a general conceptual sense, and then we're going to bring it right down to this guy right here, the Remington R51. Had some time to take it out to the range and uh, had some interesting experiences, and I want to share those with you. So a couple of things before we get going with today's Google Hangout. Remember, um, over in the right-hand side of the page, I've got my question bar. It's opening up right now. That's where you can type in your questions. And that's where I, if I'm paying attention, will see those questions and then give you the answers that you want and deserve. So remember, a Google Hangout is going to be much better if we're interacting. Second of all, uh, don't forget, this Google Hangout is going to be better the more people we have here on the Hangout. So take that URL up at the top of the page right now. I want you to go ahead and highlight it, click on Copy, tweet it, put it on Facebook status, put it up on Instagram, however it is you can get word out to folks that you think might be interested in this topic, please do that. Our Google Hangout is going to be better because of it. If you're not live, don't worry. This will be posted up on YouTube. If you're watching from YouTube, it's not too late to share. Hopefully this information is going to be good quality information that people that care about their own personal protection are going to be able to use. Because of course, you're here at the Safety Solutions Academy, and it's where people come to try and understand and, and live a safer life through unraveling the mysteries that surround defensive firearms, trying to focus on quality defensive training, and really getting down to the brass tacks about what it means to be personally secure. So folks, uh, I do want to welcome our guest today. It's our typical Thursday guest, but he's not a typical guy at all, Grant Cunningham. Grant, how are you doing today? Great, Paul. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, I'm it's here that I'm not typical. No, you're you're definitely not a typical fellow, Grant. How are things out there in the uh, Pacific Northwest? Uh, very rainy, very windy. Yeah, we're in the same boat. I'm down in Florida right now um, on a, a trip, and we've got lots of rain down here, a good amount of wind, so uh, probably a little bit warmer than you've got, though, I would imagine, huh? Just a little bit. I wish I were there, actually. I think I could stand it, the rain and the wind if I were, you know, warmer. <laughs> well, that's the way that it goes. You know, folks, I mentioned that Safety Solutions Academy is the place where everyday people can come to learn how to live that safer life. And, and today, we're going to take a specific look at unraveling the handgun, trying to demystify uh, the handgun and, and one of the important parts of that, and that is its reliability. Um, Grant, you know, we've talked about efficiency in a lot of different ways. Why is it that reliability is such an important part of efficiency when it comes to a defensive firearm? Well, you know, we talk about efficiency meaning uh, using the, the least amount of resources necessary to achieve a specific goal. And in, in the case of defensive shooting, we're using our resources such as time and energy and ammunition and space and, and, and things like that to achieve the goal, making the bad guy go away. The problem is if we have a gun that is not reliable, that does not that does not shoot or shoot multiple times when we really need it to, we're going to waste a lot of time and a lot of energy and probably some space trying to clear that gun to get it back to working again, doing you know uh, malfunction clearing, all that kind of stuff that we do to get the gun to try to run in the middle of a, in the middle of an incident. And that is really, uh, if, if you look at what efficiency is, which is using the least amount of resources to achieve a goal, that is the exact opposite of efficiency because we're wasting resources. Yeah, so, I, actually, I actually have that right in, in my comments. You know, an unreliable handgun grant, really, I see that as the antithesis of being oh, efficient. Yeah. It's everything but efficient. Yeah, that's exactly it. So when I talk to, to people about getting a defensive handgun, the first thing I talk about is reliability, because if the gun isn't reliable, reliable, everything else that we talk about in terms of the attributes that we look at in a defensive firearm sort of go right out the window. It has to work first, otherwise it, it doesn't make any sense to have it. Absolutely. Now, one of the things that we get into, Grant, is when we talk about reliability in relation to 
mechanical devices. Anybody that has their wits about them with regards to mechanics understands that every device at some point in time has a failure. Every device has a duty cycle. So what is it that we look for and try and understand and balance out the fact that we're talking about you know, a, a mechanical device that eventually is going to fail with what is good enough, I guess? Maybe that's the question that I'm asking. What's reliable enough with a defensive handgun? What are your thoughts? The for years the the what I've told my students is that reliability means that the next time you pull the trigger, the the gun will function exactly as it's supposed to function. In other words, it'll fire, it will extract, it will load if it's an auto loading pistol, of course, uh, and it will fire again the next time that you do that. And I think that's a reasonable expe expectation to have. You're right in that some that mechanical devices fail. That's, that's certainly true. But we also need to be careful when we talk about that, that some mechanical devices fail at a greater rate than others. Right. And I ask people, we, uh, this very often comes up when we talk to people, students who are having unreliable firearms, that they're having reliability problems with their firearms on the line. And they will say, well, gosh, every gun fails eventually. Yeah, every car fails eventually, but I'll bet the last time you went shopping for an automobile for as a commuter car that you probably looked at repair records and breakdown rates and factored that into your decision. It's just as important to do that when we're talking about a defensive firearm. Yeah, they all break. Some break more often than others. And those are important points that you bring up, Grant, because you know we know that it's going to fail eventually, but we've got time, effort, and energy that need to be used in our lives for lots of different things. And the question is, is how much time, effort, and energy do we want to be placed into that defensive firearm to make sure that it's ready to go? And some are much easier to maintain than others. And it goes right to that automobile analogy we've been talking about for the past couple of weeks. Sure, you could rebuild the motor on your you know, fancy super duper, super old car every 3,000 miles, every 6,000 miles to be able to drive back and forth to work. But why not just get a car that only needs an oil change every 3,000 or even 6,000 miles these days? Just from an efficiency standpoint, even when you're not in the fight, it makes a whole lot of sense to have a mechanical device that has a much longer duty cycle. Mm -hmm. So when we look at handguns, there are some handguns that have a reputation of having a much longer duty cycle than others. I look specifically at revolvers in comparison to semi-automatics. Um, there are some semi-automatics of a, of a more modern design that tend to be more reliable than others. H how is it that people should sort through the generalizations that go along with defensive firearms to, s to select that firearm that's going to be reliable? Well, in fact, one of the major selling points of a revolver is the fact that it does have a, a mean time between failure that's mm -hmm. that's longer than than most auto loaders and that's because it's a very mature design not much has changed in the last realistically the last hundred years right uh, it's been very very well sorted out and people have certainly attempted to make changes to it to modernize it, but by and large are pretty much the same. It's a very mature technology. Auto-loading pistols, on the other hand, were mature technology maybe only in the last 30 years. Right. And prior to that, we were still working through bugs. You know, the, the auto-loading pistols that we could get in the 1970s when I was a kid were not anywhere near as reliable as what we have today. So what I tell people is, if you're, if you're going to buy a revolver, great, but if you're going to buy an auto-loading pistol, Look for one of a more modern design and manufacture, something that's been designed in the last 20 or 30 years that has been designed with reliability first and foremost with the modern ammunition that we've got. Uh, a lot of guns were certainly designed to be reliable with the military ammunition that was in mm -hmm. use uh, 125 years ago. But today we have a, a different set of standards we have uh, modern hollow point ammunition, we need the gun to be reliable with that. So look. For, what I tell them is look for something of modern design and manufacture. Okay, that sounds pretty good, Grant. So as I'm looking through those modern guns, I'm sure that I can go places online, I can, I can look at reports, I can read about guns that people are having problems with, guns that they're not. But when I find that, quote, reliable handgun, one that's going to be efficient for me, one that's going to work well size-wise, concealment-wise, recoil management-wise, how do I find out that that particular model, going with the car analogy, isn't a lemon? What is it you suggest to your students? Well, you know, back in the old days, 
and the old days meaning the early 1990s. So that's mm -hmm. old days now. But back in the old days, we used to tell people, well, you need to run 200 rounds of your preferred defensive ammunition through the gun to make sure that it's reliable. Well, there are some problems with that, not the least of which is today, not only is getting that, that amount of defensive ammunition pretty hard, it's also right. very expensive. Mm -hmm. And so we start looking at reliability in two areas. The first is general mechanical function. In other words, does the gun function as it was designed to function? The second part of that reliability thing is, does it function with the ammunition that you've picked, which is a completely different set of circumstances. So what I tell people today is if you want to test a gun for reliability, shoot, say, 100 rounds of just plain ball ammo through it just to check that the gun fires and extracts and you know magazines work and all that sort of thing, and then put through 50 rounds of your preferred defensive ammunition. That'll make sure that the gun isn't going to choke on that specific brand, type, weight, shape, and all that sort of thing. Between the two of those, it's, it's relatively expen inexpensive to do. You're going to shoot up 100 rounds of ball ammunition in, in practice anyway. And then a little bit of that defensive ammunition. And in my experience, that will sort out all of the lemons. That, that first 100 rounds of ball ammunition that you do, if you've really got a lemon, that will sort it out. And then that 50 rounds of defensive ammunition will make sure that it works with that stuff. And that makes a lot of sense, Grant. So how is it that I know if I've got a lemon or not? How many malfunctions in that first 100 rounds of just regular training ammunition? How many malfunctions are acceptable? Generally, I'd say zero. The, the guns that we have today, you know, back in the old days, we would talk about having to break in a gun. Right. And I haven't really seen guns that need to be broken in all that much anymore. And it, if you want to, and I, I tell people, listen, if you're really concerned about breaking the gun in, before you go out and shoot it, uh, sit there and rack the slide by hand 50 or 100 times to work out any burrs or anything else, then clean it, lubricate it as per the manufacturer's recommendations, then go out and shoot it. That's about all the break-in a modern gun really needs. You know, it's interesting you bring that up, Grant, because, you know, I, I'm talking about this R51, and we're not going to go there quite yet, but I'm going to kind of allude to it. I've spent a lot of time with this gun before I even got it out to the range. Uh, it, it, the slide must have been racked easily 100, if not 200 times. Um, the gun was assembled, uh, reassembled, um, disassembled, excuse me, reassembled. Um, it was lubricated properly, and I actually got much better function than many people are reporting. But, you know, I, I listen to what you're saying, and I, and I hear all these things, and this is what I focus on when it comes to defensive firearms as well. But at the same time, there are guns that are being manufactured today that are being released to the public as defensive firearms that wouldn't pass that 100-round test. Mm -hmm. and, and it frustrates me and it makes me even a little bit angry, and I'm certainly disappointed with manufacturers that they choose to continue to manufacture firearms that aren't reliable. How does this happen? You've got a lot more business sense. You've got a lot more history as a businessman than I do. You know, We both have a firearms background, but you've got more. How does this happen in this kind of an industry? What are your thoughts there? I think the I think there there are several things working at once here. First of all, we have to remember that serious defensive shooters, for lack of a better term, are a relatively recent phenomenon. We didn't, and realistically, until about the mid-1970s, right. nobody ever really demanded a lot of their guns. It's only since, realistically, since Jeff Cooper uh, institutionalized the study of defensive handgunning that we start really making demands of our guns. So part of it is that. Uh, the second part of it is that there are a lot of people who, even though they bought a handgun for self-defense, don't really go out, they don't train with it, they don't really practice with it. They'll go shoot a couple of magazines, and it works that long, and they assume that the gun will continue to work. Right. So there's, uh, there's some of that at work. And then we get into brand loyalty. Uh, let's face <laughs> it, I can't think of, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm a farm boy. And I grew up with the the discussions, the arguments about Chevy trucks versus Ford trucks. Sure. I mean, this is, right? The <laughs> the brand loyalty and brand snobbishment brand snobbishness among shooters makes the Ford versus Chevy arguments look like like playtime. Uh, people get very very attached. They have a lot of emotional attachment. A lot of 
perhaps um, ego investment in the guns that they have and so they will tend to excuse those errors, those malfunctions, those problems when they occur. So I think it's a combination of things that's probably different for every single person that, that sits there and looks at his malfunctioning gun and say, it's, no, it's just fine. Yeah, and there are a lot of folks that do that, aren't there, Grant? You know, um, <laughs> I was out at the range again, you know, with this Remington R51, and I've wanted to love this gun since it was released, and I've worked really hard to do so, and uh, it's just not quite there. Let's start to talk about this Remington R51 and, and putting egos aside and everything else. Uh, folks, basically this pistol is designed to be a, and, and we'll show you that it's a, um, an unloaded firearm there. You can see into the chamber. Actually, you can see very well today. Um, well, so we have an uh, unloaded firearm here. This gun was designed as a single stack 9mm handgun. It was designed from the ground up uh, based on a model from the 1915, I believe it was. Is that the original R51 grant? 1913, yeah, 1915? 1912, something like uh, yeah, that. Yeah, something in that, like forever ago. And yeah. uh, the gun's been redesigned from the ground up to be a defensive firearm. And so that certainly excited me a lot. Um, I also will admit that I was really looking forward to a, a Glock that doesn't exist, the single stack 9mm Glock being released at SHOT Show this year. We found out before SHOT Show that that wasn't going to happen. And at about the same time, we found out that the R51 was going to happen. And so I thought to myself, maybe this is the answer. If Glock's not going to do it, maybe Remington will. Smith & Wesson kind of did it with the Shield, but not quite. XDS kind of did it with the, or XD Springfield, with the XDS kind of, but not really. Um, and so I thought maybe this would be the answer for what I'm looking for in a single stack 9mm. Wanted to love it. Aluminum frame, uh, seven round magazine, a Pedersen action, which is quite different from how many other firearms operate. You can do a search and watch the YouTube videos. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, when I went out to SHOT Show, I read some information about these guns and I was pretty excited about it. Now, before SHOT Show, uh, there was a group of writers that were invited by Remington out to gun site to do some testing of this gun and they had the opportunity to test some pre-production models. Um, pre-production model meaning not coming off the factory line, probably pretty much hand-built guns um, put together um, and they had rave reviews about the firearm. Shot 5,000 rounds through you know, maybe five or seven guns and had some really good experiences with them. So I was thrilled to get out to SHOT Show and to get to Media Day to be able to shoot this gun only to get there and have this gun not be out on the range. And that to me was the, was the first occurrence or first clue maybe that there was something not quite right with that Remington R51. When we got to the SHOT Show floor, there were plenty of guns there on the floor. Um, and they were there right along with the designer. His name happens to be Adam and I talked with him quite a bit. We took some guns apart, we looked at them. I was pretty excited. And then the gun started to ship. And I don't know if you folks have heard, Grant, have you been staying up to speed with the problems people have been having with the R51s as they've been uh, shipping out? Yes, I, I've been following that with a heavy heart because I, too, really wanted to like this gun. Yeah, it's it's interesting. So I'll try and run down, you know, from the top of my head, some of the issues that, that folks have been having. Um, probably the, uh, the biggest issue that folks have reported on is has to do with this slide stop lever and the fact that if it's not reinserted just perfectly upon reassembly it will cause the gun to malfunction. There's a tiny little spring and the tab that needs to slide underneath the spring and if you don't do that your slide is going to lock back prematurely. That's not good. That's educational. That's something that people need to learn about. I'm, I'm about 50% sure that my gun came from the factory assembled incorrectly. When I took it out of the box the slide locked to the rear immediately and there was no magazine in the gun. So that was quite interesting to me that um, maybe it didn't even get assembled properly when it came from the factory. The other big issue that folks have been having is that um, on chambering around, the gun is staying, and I'll have to mimic this by holding it, um, it's staying about, I don't know, an eighth or a sixteenth of an inch out of battery. I don't know how in focus that is for you folks. Maybe that's a little bit better there. Um, What's interesting about that is when the gun is out of battery like this, the trigger will still depress if it's just right. There it goes. Now, the gun was out of battery. We had this happen several times out on the range, um, and the gun doesn't fire. The, the trigger activates, but the gun doesn't fire. The hammer doesn't drop. Um, 
So that's an interesting dilemma there. Interestingly enough, that only seemed to happen on the first round in the magazine. We had it happen many times when the gun was being loaded, but we never had it happen when the gun was being fired. Interesting. Magazine spring tension, too much, pushing up on the slide, not letting it come all the way forward with that round underneath. I don't know. It's an interesting thought. I don't, do you have any thoughts on that, Grant? That's kind of a, and I know you haven't, I don't think you've shot the gun, have you? No, I haven't. Uh, that's actually a, f a fairly logical conclusion. In fact, that's what I was thinking. Okay. As you th good, good. Okay, so sometimes that can be pretty logical. Obviously, you have a lot more experience with this kind of stuff than I do. Um, so those things are things that a lot of people have been experiencing. There's been some reports of um, rear sights being able to be pushed out of the dovetail, which would indicate some poor machining tolerances or poor tolerances on the sites that are being built. I don't know where parts are being assembled from, but those things are um, definitely problematic. And Grant, I don't know if you've seen these pictures yet, but let me throw this up on the screen. This is what I found, and this is what really concerns me, and I haven't heard anybody else talking about this issue. And if you take a look at this picture, that might be a little bit concerning. Can you see up there on your screen, Grant, what it is that's, that I'm showing? Yeah, I, I see the little thumbnail of it here. Okay, and so you only get a thumbnail. All right. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I see this is the first time you had described it to me, and this is the first time I've actually seen the picture. Yeah, it's um, a pretty massive primer flow is what it is. Wow. Um, we're talking about primer flowing back into the primer pocket. And I'm going to go ahead and, and bring up another picture here. Actually, I could have done a little bit more simply than that, maybe... You know, here we've got two cases next to each other, and again, Grant, I don't know how clear that is to you, but we've got two different brands of ammunition, and we've got a tremendous amount of primer flow from both types of ammunition. Yeah. And this is primer flowing back into the firing pin hole. Now, the first picture that I showed you, folks, um, I thought was maybe the most important picture to show you. It is, um, and I'll go back to it now, it is Remington ammunition standard pressure. Now, of course, the R51 is set up to be able to use plus P ammunition, but here we have a standard pressure ammunition that has a tremendous amount of primer flow, not something that I would expect to see from just about any um, handgun, let alone a handgun designed to deal with plus P pressures. Now, my first thought was, okay, what is it that's causing this kind of primer flow? Twelve different types of ammunition, all shot in the same atmospheric conditions, some uh, standard pressure, some plus P, some plus P plus, and all of the ammo exhibited substantial primer flow. And this, to me, immediately uh, screamed a head spacing problem. Now, I know what head spacing is, Grant, but maybe you can, being more of the technical gunsmithy guy, maybe you can help folks understand what what head space is in a gun. Well, head spacing, in, when we're talking about a straight wall pistol cartridge, uh, refers, the, the end result actually refers to the amount of space between the, the head of the cartridge and the breech face of the gun. And in, in a rifle cartridge, it's, slight, it's a slightly different measurement, but in the case of a straight walled handgun cartridge, that's it. So if you have, if, if this is the head of your cartridge and this is the breech face of the gun, there's a very narrow tolerance how close these two can be. If they're further apart than that, the headspace is excessive. And ex excessive headspace can be dangerous. It can lead to, to ruptured cases. Um, and, of course, shrapnel being blown out the magazine, it can mm -hmm. cause uh, sometimes catastrophic failures. So head spacing is something that all of us that, uh, that deal with, the, with guns and repairing and customizing and all that sort of thing pay a lot of attention to, and the, the tolerances are fairly strict. So what I've done here, Grant, is uh, as soon as I saw this problem, I jumped on the interwebs, and, and I'll see if I can hold it up here. You folks don't have to worry. This isn't a loaded handgun. You can see that I've placed something into the chamber, and what it is that I've placed into the chamber is what's called a no-go headspace gauge. This is a, a special tool. It's machined. Um, it's hardened steel, and it's built specifically to be able to test the headspace. And a no-go gauge, what it shouldn't allow is it shouldn't allow the gun to close. Basically, this is a cartridge that would signify something that was too long. And yet, you can see from this uh, picture right here, 
the gun closes very easily. There was no force involved. You can see the back of the firearm. Uh, we are fully in battery. This gun, as far as I can figure, is clearly out of spec. Now, to me, with the reading and understanding that I have, Grant, um, and I'll show you folks this little case gauge. You can see on it here, I just picked that up off the computer after it ejected. It says, I need to put it right in front of my face for it to focus. Uh, come on. Well, you can't read it, but it says no go on there. Um, there it is, no go. And this is this is a case that should not fit into the chamber of a 9mm handgun. It just shouldn't happen. Um, so in, in my reading and understanding, if I were to buy from someone a used handgun, I might from time to time find that the no-go case would go in. And that would mean I'd need to do some further inspection of the gun to find out what it was that was wrong. Um, but this is not a condition, and Grant, you tell me, am I wrong? This is not a condition I should find in a brand new handgun. Would that be correct? I would not expect that to, to be found in a brand new handgun. Uh, the the headspace gauge shows us the generally the outer limit of what the the headspace tolerance should be. There's another gauge called a field gauge that tells us what the maximum safe right. headspacing is. So we've got a gun here that's somewhere between the uh, the the maximum spec and being on the safe. It's somewhere in that range. We don't know exactly where. And and so you would say, Grant, that this gun is outside of Sammy's spec. Is that correct? I would say it would. I would say it's outside of spec. Yeah. yeah. I would not expect that to happen with a with a brand new gun. Uh, now I'm I'm sure that occasionally you get a lemon, and this might just be a lemon. Right. Because we talked about that, and uh, the QC on some of Remington's products lately, let's be charitable, has not been great. So it might just be this gun. But it would be. It's concerning to me that a new gun out of the out of the box will close on a no-go headspace gauge. Yeah, that is that is bothersome. Now I've got in my hand right here holding it up and I'll see if I can get it to come into focus for you folks. Here is one of the cases from the Remington R51 and you can see how that primer is bulged and standing out of the back end. And what's causing that is the primers flowing back into the firing pinhole, which could also be an oversized firing pinhole combined with this excessive headspace. Yeah, it, it, it could be. That's a, the, the logical conclusion is, you know, uh, an excessively large firing pinhole and slightly excessive head spacing. And I think when you and I originally talked about those, that's, I think, exactly what I said. Yeah, right. That, that is exactly right, Grant. And so one of the questions that I have right now is, I'm wondering if other folks out there that have R51s are experiencing um, primer flow. And it may be one of those things that's just gone unnoticed. I mean, how many folks actually spend a lot of time picking up brass? There are places where you can't pick up brass. Uh, we know that these guns don't have a tremendous amount of rounds through them because they're pretty darn new. So I'm really curious if you're one of those folks that has um, information about your primers. And I'll put this up on the social medias um, as well. And, and uh, look for some information to find out if this is a one-off problem um, or if this is something that's more concerning and, and more standard. Either way, it's another, I don't want to say nail in the coffin because I think this gun has some potential, but at the same time, in the public's eye, boy, we're, we're really headed down a rough road with this gun. Where, where do we go from here with this particular gun, Grant? Is this something that, uh, that I should continue to do testing on or what do you think? Personally, I'd send it back to Remington and include some of the fired cases and indicate to them that, you know, this thing closed on a no-go gauge. We've got primer flow issues. I don't think this gun is safe. Fix it or replace it. Uh, it's not a gun that, after seeing that, it's not a gun that I would continue to shoot. Yeah, and I think that's exactly probably what I'm going to do, Grant. Uh, I had a chance to put the 12th um, type of ammo through it yesterday and thought maybe, just maybe, it would be uh, okay. But, of course... It wasn't, and so it's time to put it in the box and fire it back off to Remington and see what they have to say, which opens a whole new chapter in this experience to see how it is that Freedom Group um, currently is handling this issue with the R51s, because I bet I'm not the only guy that's going to be sending an R51 back. Um, interestingly enough, Grant, I had a chance to shoot some other guns out of the range that did do a pretty nice job. I mentioned the Smith Wesson Shield was kind of, eh, not so much. You know, the and really what it is with the Shield is the manual safety. That's a problem. Um, I don't prefer manual safeties on my striker fire guns, number one. 
and number two, such a small manual safety that is um, very difficult to manipulate. If it was accidentally engaged, that would be a major problem in a critical situation. So uh, it's not my favorite gun. The XDS has a backstrap safety, which I don't prefer. Now, let's be fair. Let's talk some more about the Remington. It has a, a backstrap safety on it as well, a grip safety, excuse me. Um, yeah. How do you feel about the XDS safety, which is located here and hinged at the top, compared to the Remington R51 that's hinged at the bottom and goes the entire length? Thoughts? You know, I've, I've been a fan of that style of safety for a very long time. Uh, the Remington R50, the original Remington 51 used it. The uh, old Colt model 1903, which I have one in my safe, uses the same mm -hmm. system. And I've always felt that it was a if if you had to do a grip safety, that was the way to do it. And the the issue that I have with the XD safety, and I'm sure you've seen the same thing. Occasionally, you get that person uh, with that gun in class whose anatomical makeup is such that there's a little hollow there right. in that you know in this web and they don't consistently get that safety engaged. On a 1911, the safety is a little longer. You run into that less frequently, but you still run into it occasionally. Absolutely. The, the full-length ones hinged at the bottom, I don't think I've ever seen an issue with anybody with those because anywhere you grab the gun, it's going to defeat the grip safety. So I prefer that design, and one of the reasons I, I was so excited about this gun was that they had resurrected that grip safety design, and, and my feeling was, if I have to have a grip safety, that's the one I want. Well, and, and what's interesting, Grant, is the idea that this gun is actually a single-action firearm. Yeah. And you don't see many single-action firearms out there without a manual safety. In fact, I can't name one myself. I can't name a single action semi-automatic handgun that doesn't have a manual safety. I'm sure that you're going to come up with three of them right now, so go ahead and do that. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of any. Oh, I'm wow. sure there are some. That, you know, it probably Actually, I can think of one, the, um, the Tokarev pistol from the communist bloc originally did not go. have a safety on it. That's yep. the only one I can think of. There you go. Um, which explains why they carried that gun typically the way it was carried. Um, but here we have a single action firearm that has uh, the only safety, let me say that differently, the only active safety on it that the user needs to interface with is right here on the back strap. And that's going to be done in an automated fashion. So it's a pretty reasonable design. Um, I did get to shoot uh, the XDS 4.0. And I'll tell you what, Grant, when that gun is in your hand, um, empty, it feels odd. Very heavy in the muzzle, um, but once you get a full magazine in that gun and once you start pressing the trigger, I was pretty impressed with that gun. Um, so that's something to definitely get your hands on if you can and do some testing with. If you're in the market for a single stack 9mm, right now that gun is at the top of my list. I'm not a super fan of the backstrap safety, but if you need a single stack 9 that's the one that I would recommend you go with. Um, or change the way you dress, conceal a handgun so you can deal with a double stack because really those are the guns that are the most reliable out there. If you were telling somebody to head towards a single stack 9mm grant or if someone was telling you that's what they needed to add to, do you have any different suggestions on that? You know, one of the issues with all of the single, with all the modern single stack nine millimeters that we have today, are simply the fact that getting one that, that's a reliable, right, which is proven to be a real problem. I, I mean, we have the R51, which is having problems. The Bursa BP9CC, which yep. which is a gun I really liked, uh, turned out to have severe uh, function issues. And then we take a look at other guns th that have manual safeties on them, which are kind of silly in this day and age. I don't like the manual safeties either, and I tell people don't buy guns with manual safeties. So it really comes down to, at the moment, if you want a single stack 9mm, you really have two choices. And the first choice is the XDS, uh, either the, the, the 4.0 or the regular one. I right. have not shot the 4.0 yet. And I think I would like it because I really didn't like the, the regular XDS. Okay. So I think I'd like the 4.0 uh, better. And the only other real choice are the are the single stack cars. That's it. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of uh, reliable, efficient handguns these days. And uh, I'm not all that wild about the cars. Yeah, the cars don't get brought up very often. And uh, actually, my first centerfire handgun ever was a car, interestingly enough. And uh, that those cars, uh, it's, it's funny we bring them up because we talked about break-in. You know, that's one of the only handguns out there that comes with a break-in routine 
um, here yeah. in 2014. And, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of people shy away from it. I don't know that I'm sold against the cars. They do seem to be fairly reliable. Um, but I'll tell you what I've got my fingers crossed for, you know, and that's going to be uh, the Glock that they came out with a 42 and 380 this year. And my sincere hope is they're going to come out with a 9mm single stack Glock for 2015. It only makes sense for them to do so. And I really hope that at the same time they come out with a long slide version because the 4.0 has some uh, distinct advantages when it comes to carrying with that longer slide and in the pants waist carry, in the waistband carry. You can tell I'm on vacation, Grant. I'm a little off my, my pace today. Um, in the waistband carry, that longer slide helps to balance out the weight of the magazine or the grip and keep it in the belt. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing that happen. And I think that is going to be the answer to the reliable single stack, the one that's done right. The other thing that I could see happening that I would really be pleased about is if Smith & Wesson followed through and released the shield, as they've talked about doing, in a what they call a law enforcement version, which would not have the manual safety. If that were the case, I'd be done shopping right now, wouldn't worry about getting a lock. I'd simply switch over to the to the M and P um, shield. It would be it would be the handgun that would go into my waist. And hopefully they come out with a long slide version because that'd be pretty slick. I agree with you. Yeah. The, uh I you know I like the shield and if they come out with a pro version without the silly manual safety, I'll buy one. Uh, because I think that will be the right gun. Uh, if Glock comes out with a single stack, I'll look real hard at that. Uh, but, you know, at, at the moment, they're just, you would think, you know, and the funny thing is we have so many choices in double stack guns, right. some really great choices, right. and we don't have that in the single stack guns for some reason. Yeah, uh, well, hopefully we'll see that in the next couple of years. Grant, what is going on with uh, yourself and Personal Security Institute these days? What do you have happening that's exciting? Oh gosh, we've got. Uh, of course, we've got a class coming up with you in uh, in Ohio here, uh, in just a couple of months. Yes. And I'm really looking forward to that. We're going to be teaching defensive revolver fundamentals, talking about using the revolver to defend yourself and and your family when you're attacked. And uh, we've got some other classes coming up uh, around the country. I'll be teaching in California and and, and uh, Florida and some other places. So uh, very busy this uh, this year. Just teaching. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. I'm certainly looking forward to your uh, defensive revolver fundamentals course. I spent some time with the revolver yesterday. Fired about 50 rounds out of my 342, I think it is. Um, and I, I'm looking I'm looking for a 642 or a 442. <laughs> Um, I'll admit it. I don't. It, it bites. I, I don't like it. Um, and and the 442s or 642s aren't that much heavier. Um, but I'm certainly looking forward to getting out and you know putting a couple hundred rounds, if not. What, what's the round count for the class, Grant? Is it uh, 700 rounds okay. over? We're going to go through about five or six hundred rounds over two days. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So that'd be great to get through that kind of a round count um, on the double action trigger because there's no doubt that that's one of the challenges of the revolver is working with those heavier triggers. So I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be a good time. And of course, you folks can uh, head to the website. You know, I'll do one of these little things here. I'll put a box up there um, and, and let you know uh, where you can sign up for that defensive revolver's fundamental class. Um, actually, that's going to be, I think, Grant, tell me if I'm wrong, a personal defense network tour course as well. We're inside the tour date, so we'll, you know that'll be a little extra incentive for you. You'll probably get a T-shirt and a, a little uh, PDN chip uh, at the completion of class, as well as uh, the outstanding information, which is really the reason why you should come, um, of training with Grant Cunningham. So, Grant, any parting thoughts for folks as they shop for that uh, reliable handgun, what it is that they should be looking for? Yeah, what I would say is don't let sentiment, don't let uh, people's uh, love of antiques drive you to something that is not efficient, not reliable. It, the information's out there. You can find out the, the reliable guns, the efficient guns, and go and shop for those. There, you get into the gun store, you're going to have a lot of people giving you all kinds of opinions based upon some, sometimes nothing more than what somebody else told them. That's right. And so you have to go in, you have to go in knowledgeable, know what you're looking at, have three or four options that you're going to look at that fit the, your criteria and pick one of them. And don't allow yourself to be sold some yourself to be sold something that you know isn't right for you. Outstanding. Well, Grant, as always, I want to say thanks so much for uh, joining us. 
the information that you helped to provide and, and uh, clarify on thoughts that I have is, is certainly priceless and I appreciate it. Where can folks find you and uh, your writings and, and uh, everything else that goes along with Grant Cunningham? Well, you can find uh, my books on Amazon and at the gundigestbookstore.com. And you can always find my latest blog entries relating to self-defense and training and that kind of thing at personalsecurity.us. And you'll also find all my social media stuff there. You can find my Flipboard magazine, which uh, deals with uh, self-defense and, and training issues, plus Twitter and, and Facebook and Google Plus and all that other stuff. Outstanding. Well, again, Grant, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, I'm hoping I'm going to see you again next Thursday night, and I uh, hope that uh, you know we've got a bunch of viewers on tonight. I hope we see you folks back. I know that some of you have had some concerns about audio quality and video quality. You know, I'm cranking with the $275 mic. It's probably really hot right now. Um, doing the best I can. The issues we run into, most of them are bandwidth related. So we do the best that we can. Our option is uh, to either do a live show with some bandwidth issues or to not do a live show. So here we are doing what we can do and as we learn more um, and are able to uh, increase bandwidth, we'll do that. So thanks to all of you folks for tuning in. Those of you that are tuning in after the fact, don't forget to share the uh, Safety Solutions Academy Hangouts. Hopefully these Hangouts are providing some great information. If you can head over to safetysolutionsacademy.com and subscribe to our email list, we'd certainly appreciate that. And while you're there, don't forget to check out the course schedule and sign up for Grant's course in July. Folks, whether you've got that uh, defensive firearm uh, in your hand and you feel it's reliable or not, you need to figure it out. And one of the ways you can do that is by getting out there and doing some training. So do that, get on out there, Get yourself some training when you do. Make sure you keep it simple. Please stay safe, and as always, have a great day.